Hi there. We're in the studio again today. Here we are. Hello, studios. And day number whatever it is. <laughs> it's so quiet in here. Um, but I'm happy to have you join me if uh, you're following along with this video series. We started it a week. I don't know why I said we. I started it about... Um, a week and a half ago now when we had to close up shop for uh, businesses for um, COVID and yeah so here we are in the studio and I said we I think because I have a loyal group of followers started to uh, join us here in the studio and I think that's fantastic because um, the purpose of these videos was to help people stay positive and, hi Pam, positive and creative during this uh, crazy, crazy time. So whatever it is you are working on that is um, your creative outlet, go get your supplies, set yourself up at your table, whatever it is you're doing, it is time to... Um, Time to get creative. Um, I've mentioned this in every video, but for me, this is how I stay sane. <laughs> this is how I stay um, positive, I guess, during this time. And if I didn't have creativity as my as my outlet, I would be um, going stir crazy, like I'm sure many of you are. So anyway, so whatever your creative outlet is, hi Maria, um, whatever your creative outlet is, I want you guys to make sure that you are diving deep into creativity now and pulling out your supplies, pulling out your journals, crafting, doesn't matter what you do. I spend a good deal of my morning just um, uh, journaling. So um, I, do I write anything of importance? Probably not. But it just allows me to, hi Yvonne, it just allows me to have a little bit of a, a creative outlet in the morning. So as you can see, this uh, this not having to clean up after myself thing isn't really treating me very well because I'm getting messier and messier and messier. And this isn't even my studio, right? This is the common space in the studio that I share that I should be leaving clean because that's rule number one of being in a co-op studio. Um, environment is that you have to leave the place clean. So uh, I keep laughing to myself because my number one rule is you have to leave it the way you found it. And I keep walking in going, yep, this is just how I left it. So um, yeah, anyway, time to clean up at some point, maybe before starting a new painting. But today what we're going to be doing is you guys are going to be working on whatever you're working on. And I am going to set up my phone Put on my apron and we're gonna get work in here. Let me flip this around. There we go. Whoops a daisy. So I just want to take a quick little moment to acknowledge everyone who has been supporting my um, our local uh, hospital charity or my local hospital charity fundraiser. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you all have hospitals in your areas. You all have charities that I'm sure feel near and dear to your heart. Um, I wanted to give people a tangible item that they could have to remember um, uh, your valuable contribution at this time. And so that's why I am working with this printer to have printer made, uh, prints made of my print. So even for those of you who have been saying to me, oh, it's okay, you don't have to mail it, that Maria, you're one of them. Please, 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 hi, Joan. Um, for all you guys, I just want to say thank you. I will get the prints to you one way or another. Um, our hospital really, really needs the help right now. And we really, it sounds like a telethon. Um, and we really appreciate it. But I first and foremost, just want to say thank you so much because it, um, it always, um, it always, uh, makes me feel a little bit helpless at the beginning when I find out that there's something going on in our community and you know and people are saying to me um, we all need to to band together and and raise funds for this and that sort of thing and when this email came across my my desktop 
the one part I didn't put in the email was that, hi Amelia, the one thing I didn't put in the email was that my friend who sent the email talking about the desperate need for the hospital measures, um, she had also mentioned that uh, she had just contributed a thousand dollars and to a, a poor artist, hi Denise, to a poor artist I just went, oh, how can I give a thousand dollars? I just possibly can't think of a way. So, um, and where there's a will, there's a way because I wanted to be able to do more than that. And I'm only in uh, day two of my three day fundraiser. And I have to say so far I have uh, about $2,500 raised for the hospital. So I am so happy and so blessed and thanking you all for your contributions. Um, I promise you that you won't be disappointed with the prints. Um, my printer and photographer, does such an amazing job that everybody is always uh shout out to mark he is just incredible and everybody will be so thrilled with their prints and um let's hope that you know this 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 time this disease this this virus um you know we can we can curb its enthusiasm for invading our planet and we can just carry on with what we're doing. But uh, for now, we all have creativity and that's what we're doing here today. So I will get off my soapbox now and say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, keep up the, uh, the, the, the creativity and also keep up thinking about how you can contribute in your own communities as well because even one artist um, who couldn't figure out how she could possibly match a friend's donation of a thousand dollars has now almost tripled that donation. So um, every single person makes a difference, right? So um, yeah, without further ado, let's get back to this painting. So I'm going to move this back because we were talking yesterday about um, scale, right? So yeah, speaking of scale, there's my last pan. Um, I'm trying to put a little, hi Dulce. Okay, there. Okay, good. So here we are. We were talking about scale yesterday. So we were talking about um, taking our paintings and um, making them larger or being able to increase the size or the quantity of whatever it is we're working on. And rather than it only being a shift in mindset that you'll often hear people talk about, it's also a shift in in, in your materials and your, your physical, um, um, I'm gonna call them steps for walking through your process. So for me, obviously, the first thing we're going to deal with, right, is so if you're normally used to working this big and now you want to go this big, you need to buy a panel or a canvas that's this big. So once you have a bigger surface, now we need bigger tools, bigger papers for collage, um, bigger images, bigger brush strokes. That means bigger paint brushes. Um, so just think that if you're going to, to be increasing the size, of your panel, you also need to increase the physical size of everything else. So yesterday I was looking at the um, um, comments and it didn't seem to me like anybody had any questions with regards to um, going large. So if you have like, like changing the size of your paintings, um, so if you have any specific questions or anything, make sure you throw them in there today and I'll keep glancing back and having a look and maybe answering them as we go. Um, a couple things that I normally see in people um, in a classroom setting when they're going large is that, or they showed me the output of it afterwards, is that sometimes, sometimes they'll still work small and then they make the background really big, which is a great first step, but then the artwork itself is still contained. So then there's this whole border of, so imagine this being all this one background that I successfully created, and then I still went ahead and added, um, I'll see if I can find a picture. Oh yeah, so imagine if I had created this whole big background and then I went and put him here, right, as my my art. So it's 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 
congratulations for making a great big background, but you still need to increase this. So if this is the art and this is the focus, then it, um, and I'm not even talking about an image, right? I'm talking about overall um, appreciation for the entire piece of art. Um, it can't just be background with now the same size piece of art in it. Um, technically, right, when you're, when you're selling a piece of art or you're uh, talking a about a piece of art and describing your piece of art, your dimensions of your art in the painting would be for the, you know, without the frame size. So I would caution you against, because I've seen this many times, people making this big background yet keeping their art still um, 8 by 10 or whatever, right? And then saying, oh, I'm charging now for, a, you know, 36 by 48, whereas the art itself, whatever you are focusing on, is still simply small, just placed on a bigger background. So that's just one thing that uh, you can't cheat scale. Right, so whatever it is you're going to be doing, it needs to be generally bigger. So that might mean bigger photocopies, um, bigger papers. I showed you guys yesterday the roll of paper. So you can buy lots of rolls of paper, um, wrapping paper, printed paper. This is uh, some kind of a decorative paper that I bought from, um, I think it came from Iron Orchid Designs. Hi Karen. IOD and um, I think that's where it came from. Um, anyway, you can buy printed paper, wallpaper, wrapping paper, any kind of paper, tissue paper, but just make sure everything is scaled up, right? So specific questions related to um, going larger in, uh, in scale, I'm more than happy to entertain today as well. So the other thing I want to talk about was, so yesterday I left everything wet. Remember my tip for um, mixed media painting is that you always have the advantage of when you're walking away to leave your painting wet, meaning that drips and, and things like that can actually have time to dry because you're walking away from it. So I left this painting very, very soggy yesterday. So today I went through it with a scraper and I just scraped off any loose bits of paper. And that was my advantage um, of letting it dry because now the paper was, um, okay, one quick question here. Anyway, so now the paper was dry so it, was, it easily came up. So can you piece the mousse or better to have a professional printer do it in one piece? Okay, so um, very good question. I have definitely done, it's called tiling. So you can tile your your uh, picture and then just print it in 8 by 11 or whatever and sometimes it looks kind of nice if they overlap a little bit and they're a little bit off and I find that that's actually really interesting rather than having it one um, one big size and it's also more convenient right if you're doing it from your um, okay Amelia one sec so you can do it from your um, your own computer if you're at home, right? So it's convenient. But if you want to be able to, uh, yeah, so T-I-L-E or T-I-L-I-N-G, it's tiling the, um, the image. And I know people who are really good at different software and different apps and things like that. I am just not that savvy with knowing which companies and, and all that stuff. I just haven't explored that in any depth because when I first started doing it, um, I think there was only, um, what's the big one that everybody uses? Uh, now it's going to slip my mind. Anyway, um, not print shop. I can't even think of what it's called. Anyway, everybody uses this um, software. And I just am not very uh, competent to use. Hi, Jane. Not competent enough to use this kind of software. So, uh, so I have before just done it on my own. Photoshop. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for. I have Shopify on the brain these days with this fundraiser I'm doing. So Photoshop. So words are going to elude me. Um, but the uh, Photoshop is what a lot of people know how to use and I just don't know how to use it. So you can also find, hi Sophie, 
You can also find um, uh, apps, I'm sure, that'll do that for you. Uh, break up your image into tiles so that you can print them on eight and a half by 11 sheet paper. Um, but here's my, my, my clue or my, my big tip for the day. Whenever I'm, I'm teaching a, a workshop, and I do have a link to this somewhere, I think, on my website, but if not, because I have a new website now, I'll add it and I'll make sure you guys get it. Um, but I actually have a PDF that explains to you exactly step-by-step step how to order um, your large prints from Staples. Um, so the best part about ordering from Staples is that they ship, right? So I don't know, Maria, if you have access to uh, Staples, but most people do for the shipping um, because it's Staples copy and print and then they will send that out to you. So, and it's really not that expensive, especially if you don't do same day and especially if you do black and white. Um, the price has gone way up though, I have to admit, like when I first, there you go, Maria, so you can use staples. Um, and I'll send you guys the PDF or I'll put it on my website and I'll link it later on. Um, I'm out for the most of the day, so I won't get to it till later, but uh, it's, if you are on the staples copy and print website, you're looking for engineering prints, okay? And um, and no, it's not laser, uh, Sophie, it's not laser, it's actually inkjet because large printing companies very rarely use laser anymore because it's not great for the employees to be breathing it. So it's not, it's not good for transfers, it's only good for collage, okay? And if you are doing a laser for transfer, correct, you need to make it laser, but you'll have to get, um, like even Staples, their largest size is 11 by 17, okay? And that's laser, and that's the largest size they have in laser. Um, okay, so Amelia asked IOD. So IOD is Iron Orchid Designs, and they are a company that does transfers, and I'm not sure if they have the paper. If they don't have the paper, then find out um, which companies, like uh, in my in my city close to me, there's a place called Malenka, M-A-L-E-N-K-A, -E and uh, the owner stocks Iron Orchid Designs transfers that she ships, and she also stocks the, the paper, but I don't know if the papers, that's where I got this one, I don't know if the papers, um, are made by the same company. I just know that it's um, it's the stores you want to contact that do um, like chalk paint for furniture. So Iron Orchid Designs makes these transfers and once you get lost in their website and on all their social law, they have so many great tutorials about how to embellish everything from candles to like everything. I use a lot of their their transfers in my art um, and I obscure things in. It's really, they have a great product, but I'm not quite sure if they're the ones who carry the paper or if it's the, the companies like the, um, like the little shops that are, are carrying the Annie Sloan chalk paint and things like that, if they're the ones who also have the papers and the transfers and all that, but I'm not 100% sure if the paper is made by Iron Orchid Designs or not. So if it's not, then I apologize. I don't know the name of the company yet that does this, but if you go on to Malenka's site, it should be able to tell you the source for these papers and maybe you can find them on Amazon and things like that as well. Um, but Malenka is a company uh, here in Ottawa that does ship the Iron Orchid designs and things if you can't find it closer to you. Um, if you're wanting to support somebody locally. Um, okay, let me keep painting here because otherwise I'm going to talk all day and I'm never have been going to, or going to have started anything. So I am going to, <clears throat> I've decided that the black is okay for now, but I'm going to paint it out white. So the reason I'm doing that is because the bottom feels so heavy to me now. Now I see the mousse more, but I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm, I'm liking that contrast because the picture of a moose is blurry and do I want him to be really crisp? I don't actually think I do. So I'm, I'm looking to set him back a little more. So what I'm going to do is use the white chalk paint and paint out the black part white. And then as I get closer to the moose, I'm just going to fade out the the chalk paint a little bit in some areas 
so that some of the dark remains. And the reason for that is just that I don't want the black to look like a complete outline and I don't want to lose the, um, the depth of the black by butting the white up next to the animal because then we weren't, we're not gonna be able to see them at all. So I'm gonna go heavier as I'm further away and as I get closer, I'm just gonna dry brush a little bit. And then where, especially where the mousse is very light. So where the mousse is very light, I'm gonna make sure that I'm not really 100% getting super close with the, with the white. Um, but where he's really dark, I can actually get in much closer. So again, this is all an experiment. I don't know how it's going to look. I just paint and then I step back and have a look and see. I may regret my decision to paint it white, um, but to me it was just when I came in today, my first reaction was, oh, I think I'm going to lighten that up. It feels a little heavy to me. So. That's my instinct, that's my, my creativity speaking to me, right? That's what the whole purpose is, is that we have to get quiet and engage with our own artwork and figure out what it's saying to us. All right, so. Because I'm using a, a chalk paint, it's actually really, like it dries quickly on your brush. So as I'm getting closer to, to the, um, the moose's face, I'm finding it's really feathering nicely. Like I don't have to worry about like a heavy gob of, of um, there we go, of um, acrylic paint or anything like that. It's actually really, really nice. So and the other thing is I want to avoid is making it look like an entire um, cutout. So I'm going to come in a little closer in some areas. And then like over here where the ear is being a little bit lost, I may come in afterwards with some paint and actually just paint in the ear. Um, so, so I haven't seen in a while what you guys are working on. So I'd love to know. I saw uh, this morning Pam told me that she's just setting up so um, share with us Pam tell us what you're doing the rest of you tell us what you're working on um, we had one participant who was here earlier in the conversation I haven't seen her in a while but I did see she posted on Facebook that she's having a hard time connecting with creativity and if you guys really haven't understood my my uh, response to that yet, it's just that creative blocks aren't really blocks. They're like shadows, right? We just, we've allowed the absence of, of our creativity, of our light to, to block our view, right? We just can't see anymore. So to me, the only way that I know how to remove creative blocks is, is to just it, keep yourself busy being creative. And if that means trying something different, then try something different. But also if you are, hi Julianne, if you are doing something um, um, the same, like maybe you just saying, you know, I, I'm creating my art, but it's looking the same every day then what I'm going to encourage you to do is, if you're feeling blocked, is just keep doing more of it. I find the more we do of something, we eventually get sick of feeling that block and we'll break through those barriers and be able to um, proceed with, with hearing that creative voice. It's, it's like I said, you're just in shadow at the moment and the sun will come out again and you will step aside and you will get out of your own way and you will be able to create. It's just for the very moment, um, you're letting your head get in the way, you're letting your circumstances get in the way. We really do need to um, carve out time for creativity if we are creative individuals. And I would hesitate to say that most people are, um, 
creative in some capacity, but I would hesitate to say not everybody is an artist because we don't all express our creativity in the same way. Uh, oh, good, there's Pam. So she chimed in. She says she has about four canvases she's working on. So good for you, Pam. Um, it's really funny because that is one of my, my techniques that whenever somebody tells me that they're stuck or someone tells me that you know a painting is currently frustrating them or not speaking to them or whatever they keep working it and working it and working it almost to a point where they're sick of looking at it they're sick of hearing themselves um, fight with this painting so I always encourage uh, people if that's where the point where you're at with your painting then it's probably best to start another one Always have two or three or four or whatever, how many paintings you can have on the go. Always have them on the go because it really is helpful to not dwell too long on one thing. It's like if you have a, I don't know, like a bad, bad song stuck in your head or something. You have to play a different song sometimes to um, release yourself from that, that song's grip. I did such a good job of camouflaging these legs, I don't even know where the legs are anymore. So this is gonna be an excellent exercise in filling in the blanks without having to actually fill in the blanks. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to scumble in some white down here and deal with it later. But essentially this is where legs might be. So I'm just going to um, fake that out. So if anybody's just tuning in now, what I'm doing is I did an underpainting of black and the black is serving me really well because I have, um, I have a lot of scratches and things in there and I'll bring the camera in closer afterwards um, at the end so I can show you the detail. But the black is really coming in really nicely. I'm not sure about white, but right now it's acting like a gesso, it's acting like a buffer and, and I'm okay with it. Um, it may, it may end up with some more color, but it may not be in this particular area. One will find out. So again, I'm always waiting and listening for my creative muses to tell me what's next. So if I don't know what's next, and because I'm talking to you guys, sometimes I don't always hear my little whispers of, um, of creativity speaking to me telling me what to do next so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to push through that by by just painting what feels right and so like I said in this case what felt right was what if I just were to lighten this up a little bit and make it feel lighter instead of so dark so this is something you can always do on markup, like we talked about yesterday on your phones. Um, but I'm just going to do it because I'm just showing you that every layer to me, even if the white isn't the right layer, it's just white with the contrast of the black underneath is making it feel much better to me. So there's also this really fun little area over here that I can get in with detail later and show you. But where his tail was, um, there's this really great detail in the paper that I really like. So is anybody having a tough time getting supplies these days? Art supplies? It's another great question. If you have any resources for things you want to share with the group, please do. I have to say that I ordered um, a few things off of from Michael's the other day and I just did their pickup today and it was very well done. Um, but I noticed that a lot of things I wanted to put in my cart were unavailable. So um, I don't know if they're just not stocking the stores or what's happening. Um, hi Jen. Um, so yeah, so getting supplies is kind of difficult. Yesterday because I've been running out of glue, um, I decided to stop by the Home Depot because somebody told me that they were considered an essential service and it was pickup only so I didn't realize that like 
many, 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 many big businesses have all converted to um, pickup now, which is kind of interesting. I love the way we can adapt sometimes, right? Like how we as people can adapt to our changing surroundings and situations. It actually felt very nice going to Michael's and picking up what I needed and not having to go in and look for it and get distracted by a million other things. At the same time, it was also, you know, it feels a little sad and, and uh, maybe even a little lonely, but very well done. The world is doing a good job. Well, in certain aspects, right? So we're doing what we can, but people are banding together in some ways. I know we all have our funny little observations of the way some people are handling things, which makes you furious or, you know, you can't understand if they didn't get the memo of what's going on in the world. Um, but for the most part, for the most part, we all kind of get it and do our thing. So art supplies, yeah. Anyways, I went to Home Depot, couldn't get, it, get, get my wallpaper paste. So I guess I'm going to have to go online and order it and then do my curbside pickup, which a lot of us, and I'm definitely one of them who misses shopping, um, actually physically in stores, I didn't realize how much I enjoyed like actually just showing up at a store and browsing and picking things up and looking at them and um, most times overspending because I always see more than I went in the store for. There you go. So, um, so you guys share also what you're doing, right? I want to see, hi Michaela. So I want everybody to show us what you're doing, what you're working on, how you're keeping creative um, during this time. Some people have been sharing with me that they wish they had more time to be creative, but their work has just transferred to uh, working from their kitchen table or from an office at home. So um, a lot of people are saying that they're finding it really difficult to find time to be creative. And these videos initially were, um, were made because I thought everybody's just sitting at home bored twiddling their thumbs, right? And so we're all looking for something to do. So I was just trying to inspire creativity. But now I recognize that a lot of you um, that have been messaging me and emailing me and things like that, you've been telling me that you've been enjoying watching the videos after your long day of work. So um, good for you guys. Like I think that's really important to recognize um, that these videos are even inspiring people who don't, necessarily have the same time or the same um, freedom now to create that uh, some of you may have. So good on those ones who are starting to um, heed the call of their creativity. I guess that's the best way of putting it because it's always there whether we, we um, entertain it or not, right? So I think it's really important to do so. Now I just saw a comment. I'm just going to turn around and read that. Terry says, me too. You need to touch everything. I know. And then you end up shopping more and more and more. Um, but it is really, it is really different, right? For those of us who actually, I don't do a ton of shopping online normally. So I do find it really, um, something that I am missing, missing for sure. So I'm going to follow out some of these lines that I carved in yesterday. And see how that looks. I'm enjoying the white tone. But obviously I need to put more contrast back into it. But maybe the reverse. like. My little creative muse is telling me maybe the dark should go at the top. Don't know yet. 
but we'll see. We shall see. All right, I think before I, I fuss around too much with the, the paint on this one, I think I'm gonna let that sit for a little bit, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, carve back to a little bit of the, the black that was under there. So these are very fine scratches that I'm just putting in the white paint. And for no other reason other than I like a lot of texture and I like the marks. So I'm just going to add a few of those lines back in before the paint has a time to dry. And then another weird little thing that I do often is I have repetitive marks and scratches that I often put in my artwork and some of you may find that you have these little scribbles or little symbols or little marks or a little something that you always tend to incorporate. I have two actually that I do often, um, maybe three. Um, one of them is I generally have a band somewhere of um, black and white and I can actually show you that on on a different painting. So this is one of my isms, one of my things I've been doing forever. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys can see that. I'm gonna close that to show you. So at the top of this one, there's this fine little bland, a band, sorry, of black and white. And that is um, just something that I, I've always done in my artwork. And my husband calls it Beetlejuice. He says my paintings haven't been complete until they've been Beetlejuiced. So that just seems to be one of my signature things that I do all the time. I just realized I forgot to put my microphone on today. Can you guys hear me? Um, I'm hoping so. I could plug it in at any time. So it's just something I totally forgot. Um, Actually, maybe I'll do that anyway. Maybe it's better. There we go. Okay, good. So, plugging that in. All right, so, uh, so the band black and white is something I do all the time. Uh, second thing I do all the time is lots of scratches. I don't know, I just really like scratches. I like to show um, layers and excavations. So Pam said microphone was not needed. Excellent. So is this now too loud with the microphone? Let me know that too. Um, and then the third thing that I often do is, uh, this is more subtle. I um, can hear you just fine. Thanks, Denise. So another thing that I often do is... Um, I do a counting system and uh, okay sorry so I do a counting system and if, uh, that doesn't make any sense but often there are numbers or there is some type of a tally and I've it's it's funny to me because I've had different art critics and things when they've been talking about my solo shows and they've always been saying things to me like, um, you know, what does this number mean and whatever. And it's really funny because I do these things very randomly and very um, without thinking. But what I did just here to illustrate that was I went through the painting and in groups of five, I just started doing these random little scratches. And then I just stopped. So when I look at it, it's five, oh, I just put paint all over my face. It's five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 83 is where I stopped for some reason. Um, and it's, like I said, it, it's, it's subtle, but it's also 
um, unbeknownst to me why I do that and why I do numbers, but it's something that I've always felt um, strongly about doing in my art. So um, let's wake this painting up with a wee bit of collage, shall we? Um, so someone said, I haven't figured out how to upload a photo while you're alive. Oh, I don't know anything about that. It's like somebody asked me yesterday, can you post a link to your live video? I said, I wouldn't have a clue how to do that if I tried. So that's why I've been um, having my husband upload all these videos into a YouTube channel. And I haven't gone in and done all the fancy fun stuff yet to the YouTube channel, meaning adding the, um, <coughs> pardon me, adding the, uh, the, the art and the background and all that stuff. I haven't had a chance to do anything yet or even put any descriptions on any of the videos. But at the end of the day, all the videos are there in order. Um, so if you want to watch them at any time not that these are super instructional or anything but if nothing else it's motivation to watch somebody else painting you can feel like you're in a classroom especially if you have your own music on and stuff like that so I'm just putting a little water in my glue because like I was saying I'm getting desperate for glue and desperate times call for desperate measures Got to order that wallpaper paste ASAP. Or my next video will be on how to make wallpaper paste out of flour and water and salt. And All right, so I'm going to put some watered down glue directly onto my painted surface. Up here. And I'm going to collage in some fun tissue paper. So, Remember, glue likes to stick to glue, except in tissue paper and napkins, you can't really do that. You have to just apply the um, tissue or the glue first, and then push your tissue paper or your um, napkins into the glue. Otherwise, if you try to put glue on the back of your tissue paper, it'll just tear. So. because it's so thin, we just need to um, treat it a little more delicately. So a little addition of color is actually making this um, white part in the bottom now seem a little more gentle doesn't mean it's finished yet it just means that it's taking on a little more whimsy which is not a bad thing okay whoops and my tissue kind of curled back on itself not that it really matters, but I'm just going to push that all down using a wet brush. I'm not putting glue back onto the surface if I can possibly avoid it um, for two reasons. One, the wax won't stick if, it's, if it isn't top coated. And number two is that I am running out of glue, so I am desperately trying to conserve my glue situation. All right. All right, definitely feeling a little better now. Um, as you can see, the balance is um, definitely um, a bit more, a bit more, s 
what's the word? It's it's still harsh down here, but we're we're slowly making the two speak to each other. So remember when you're painting large, not only do we have to increase our size of um, of images, and we have to increase the size of our backgrounds, and we have to increase the size of our tools and techniques and everything else. But the other thing we have to consider is that now we have to increase the the um, space and the time in which is required to balance and to pull things together. So what that means is that if we have a painting that, you know, a little painting, and then the whole thing says, oh, you know, I'm, it's lacking a focal point, then you can take one little thing this big and bloop, bop, pop it on, and there's your focal point. Um, but when we're working on something this big, then this no longer is going to suffice as a balance um, piece, right? So we need to keep having that conversation between the two pieces all the time of um, big versus little and small versus um, or gross movements, gross gestures compared to really finite ones. So um, because we're working at a really sort of macro level right now, I have to make big changes. If I were to really fuss over one little area, if I were to fuss over one little area, um, it wouldn't be significant enough to the whole overall thing. So right now what I need to do is I need to keep working as an overall painting to make big changes, big gestures, big movements um, because of the scale of this painting. So when you're working small, it's easier to pull it together faster. And just remember when you're working large, it's going to take considerably more time um, if you keep your movements really small. So you need to keep your reactions to what's happening in your painting um, corresponding to the scale of the painting you're working on, right? So I'll go over that in another direction, I guess, by saying if I'm working on a little painting this big, a six by six painting, clearly like one little brush stroke or one little mark could be the thing that um, finishes that painting. But we are a far cry in the size of this painting from adding one little mark making a difference. Hi, Laura. Um, we're, we're so far from one little gesture making a difference, right? In, in um, when we're working with such a large scale painting. So don't be afraid to put a whole pile of stuff going on, on when you're working big because you can always start to narrow it down as the painting starts to settle in and take shape and that sort of thing. So if you are a more intuitive painter, if you are one who likes to um, experiment and play and see what happens within your work, then this is great for you to, to expand your canvas size and start to work large because um, your, your tiny little brush strokes and tiny little movements and tight little um, things we do in our paintings are, are not going to serve you when you're trying to be loose and creative and free. So when you are trying to get more out of your head and more into your creativity, I suggest you get something big and just keep making big bold movements and gestures and adding colors and, and maybe even painting things out that normally you wouldn't um, paint out, maybe add a piece of collage that normally you wouldn't add. Just, you will feel the freedom of creativity if you're not accustomed to painting large. Now, I am accustomed to painting large, which is why everybody always comments that my work is very, um, when they're watching me work, they say that I, I appear very free and very comfortable, but that's just it. That's my skill set, right? I'm, I'm very comfortable working very large and very free and seeing what the painting, um, where the painting will take me rather. Um, so for any of you who are watching my earlier videos, where on my birthday I decided to stay in the studio and and my creativity got the best of me and I finished that one painting, 
it actually that painting really changed a lot and I apologize that that painting changed so much but it's just my my big broad brush strokes turned into be um, like they really engaged my creativity and when they engaged my creativity then I was just like oh okay and then when I notice that I'm starting to get tighter and tighter and tighter it means that the painting is nearing the end for me and I have to honor that and I have to finish it right so um, that's what happened when I was doing that painting is that I just I, I just got so wrapped up in the process that the the tightness started to come in and that's when I knew that that painting wasn't going to let me walk away from it so I actually had to just finish it up and um, and then I was so engaged by the process of losing myself in creativity that I ended up going into my studio and pulling out two other paintings that had been sitting on a shelf for a long time and I wound up finishing those and um, it, it felt fantastic to really be in that flow right and the only reason I was in that flow is because I've been committing I think to a discipline of being in the studio every day to provide live studio for you guys and so for me this practice this this discipline of being in here and painting um, eventually the the teacher in me just kind of subsides and stops talking and then this little voice of my creativity overrides and just starts saying hey this is fun isn't it don't we want to do more and so sometimes I find it actually hard to end after one hour and not touch the um, not touch the paintings so um, and and unless that discipline I think is made daily or or weekly or whatever it is for you unless that discipline is made it's hard to consistently engage with our our creativity right our skill is always our skill set so don't worry about that it's always there with you the more you uh, practice whatever it is you do uh, to make um I'll say creative output because I don't want to necessarily say paintings. I know some of you aren't painters. Um, but whatever it is you do to create um, artwork or creative output, you're all skilled at doing that, that which it is you do best. But when you're trying to engage creativity, that's a whole other ballgame. And that to me is where um, creative discipline, which I told you that's on my blog, on my website so if you go to my website and look under blog that's one of my latest blog posts it's on creative discipline and it's just about carving out time um, disciplined time in whatever time frame your lifestyle allows to dedicate to just playing in creativity and it's it's not necessarily just always doing that which you're you're most skilled at right it's um, actually allowing yourself time to explore new things and to try new mediums which is why um, some of you may know this about me and some may not but I do all different kinds of art classes um, because I really love seeing if my my creativity can be engaged when I'm learning something new and I'm, I'm not skilled at it right so I have to um, I have to develop skill if I'm going to continue to do that but at the same time I want to be engaged creatively and sometimes I'll go into a class and for some reason I want so badly to be skilled at this new thing that I'm I'm learning and I'm not because I haven't had the practice and it's just it isn't my skill set yet and then I've had an amazing class because my creativity comes in anyway and says well you know what do the best you can and have fun and create something fun and so and those have been great classes but other times I feel felt have felt really stifled because my creativity let me down or I let my creativity down by not just allowing it to play and have fun even though I wasn't very skilled at what it is I was doing Does that makes sense my babbling I probably am babbling but that's going to be the reality of of live studio 
I often hear when I'm at home doing this, I often hear from upstairs, my husband saying, are you talking to yourself or are you talking to me? So this is like part of being in my studio. There's a whole lot of talking going on. So I'm following some of these lines that are underneath, which you guys can't really see, but they're really subtle and they're giving me a bit of a, a road map, right? We talked about the scratches that I put in my painting provides a bit of a, a road map for me as to where to paint, where not to paint. And then some of you are going to love this. I'm going to go back to my big vat of goo that never lets me down. Uh, water. There we go. So my big vat of goo, show you guys this every time. It's just a juice jug where I clean my brushes sometimes when I have a lot of paint in them. And then I put water in it and I just keep this sludgy brown color um, going all the time. And I find it a really good, I can change any color, but with having this underneath, I find it, um, it really provides a warmth that comes through. So I always tend to use this um, big vat of goo to tone down some of my papers. So I'm going to tone down some of this um, tissue paper because I feel like the dots are, are great on the white. On the brown part, was I loving them? I like a hint of them, so I'm just going to maybe get rid of some of them. There. That's a fun little drip. Maybe I'll provide another little drip over here and carry that across. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna let that dry just a wee bit and then I am going to use my baby wipes and soften it a little bit. I'm just gonna let it dry a little bit though because the tissue paper is really gooey, right? Okay, question from Maria. She says, do you find some tissue papers have slippery shiny side that wax may not adhere to? Um, yeah, you're right. Some, I, I don't even know that if it's, is it tissue or is it vellum or is it printed on wax paper? There's definitely that. Um, if you do need to deglaze anything after you've adhered it, meaning that if it's still shiny or it looks like it may repel the wax, that's always my, my test. Whenever I look at, at a painting and when you're in a workshop with me, which you have been, um, you guys would hear me saying, okay, before we're going to go into wax, we have a few things we have to make sure, right? So the transition, and this is in my book too, so go back to the transition part of the book. I don't know what page it's on, but let's just say it's somewhere around halfway in the book. You want to make sure that the um, painting is um, not shiny. So any parts that look shiny, whether it be from glue or shiny papers or anything like that, you need to deglaze. So my best bet for doing that always is um, chalk paint if you want to provide a wash of color over it. So it'd be washed out chalk paint. Um, but if you want it to be clear because you want to leave it as is, then it's the um, Liquitex Clear Gesso, right? Which is an acrylic based product, but they've got enough um, binding materials in it that when it dries, it feels like sandpaper and all those little ridges in that, in that sandpaper will um, hold on to your wax, providing it's not a massive area, right? We're deglazing little spots. And then um, it has to be totally deglazed. It has to be on a rigid porous absorbent surface, right? So just like encaustic needs to be anyway. So if we've added chalk paints and papers and everything else, we need to make sure that we haven't used a lot of acrylic paints or anything like that. And if you have used acrylic paints in some areas, then maybe you want to avoid putting wax on that area. And um, so the shiny, oh, and then the third thing is make sure it's dry. So you can't generally paint mixed media and then wax on the same day. 
Um, you might be at risk of trapping any kind of moisture underneath your wax and that would provide, or that would, sorry, that would um, encourage like some mold growth or something like that, that we wouldn't want to do. Um, perhaps sand, meaning you want to mix sand into your paint or you want to sand it back. Just clarify that question and I'll, um, I think you mean, <laughs> can you sand it? Um, so yeah, that would help, but of course it's going to change the appearance of it, right? So, um, but yeah, you know what, that would actually, that would actually work in small amounts. Just sand the board back. So, so you know what happens when you sand something, right? Like you, you risk damaging the surface. So if you were to, uh, let, let's just take, for instance, here, um, you've just collaged in a beautiful photo of your grandparents, right? And then if it's too shiny because of the way you printed it, if I want to go put wax over that, I have to be careful because maybe I'm saying, oh, I'm, I'm a little afraid that the wax might um, uh, not stick to this because it's too shiny. So if I were to sand that, imagine now taking a piece of sandpaper and going over grandma's face with your sandpaper, it's going to damage the surface, right? So her face is going to be obliterated in some capacity, no matter how lightly you sand. So if you're in a scenario where it doesn't matter if you damage the back surface a little bit, then sanding would be great. Um, that's definitely a great way to deglaze your uh, painting and to provide some tooth for the wax to sit in. Um, but if I wanted to protect grandma's face, then what I would do is I would use the Liquitex clear gesso and I would just apply it with my finger or apply it with a brush and then smooth it out with my finger. Um, the reason I'd smooth it out is because even ridges from your brush, like from your br brush application will actually uh, be visible in the Liquitex clear gesso because they call it clear, but it's like, it's in the semi-translucent. So the thinner it is, the more um, transparent it is. So we just have to be careful not to leave any lumps or bumps because you will actually see, or grooves from the paintbrush because you will actually see that underneath. So that's just a little technical thing for anybody who's, who's um, intending on putting wax on top of their paintings afterwards. You want to be a little bit careful about the, um, the way in which you're going to do that. if the surface is considered precious, right? So clearly someone's face is much more precious than let's say like a background that I've created, right? So that to me wouldn't be one of the fine um, gestures. That to me is like, that's a pretty gross gesture at that point. If I'm, if I'm getting it to do that, picking up these drips. Some of them are smudging a little, so I'm just going to wet them. I could use a baby wipe, but I don't want to remove it entirely. So I'm just going to soften it. They are much better, but still not perfectly balanced. Like for me, there's still a whole lot, especially when I'm looking in the video. Um, hi, Crystal. Awesome to see you. Um, there's still a whole lot of um, balance issues here and it could just be that my image is just too dark and in which case that's okay I'll just work around that right like it, it's not like it um, it has to stay the way it is I can change it if I want to so I'm also going to show you another little trick because this helps me um, an awful lot, especially when I'm deciding what to do for colors. I often will grab paper and then I'll make a temporary sticker out of it. So I say temporary because I'm not really sure I'm ready to commit to gluing this in. So all I'm going to do is spray the back of any piece of paper. Let's say you wanted to see if, uh, you know, how a little bit of blue would look, work in this painting and you don't want to commit to putting blue there and then painting over if you don't like it. I just find a piece of paper that's in that color tone that I'm looking for and the size. And then I will actually just go ahead and by having it wet, I can stick it to my painting temporarily and not have it 
uh, potentially gluing there. And then that way I can stand back and look. So let's see what happens. Whoops. If I were to put this up here. Wow, see that really helps my balance. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'll try and move this a wee bit. But it really, because I said down here was really dark, like up here is really now got some, some, um, uh, some flows. <laughs> um, my, your eye isn't getting trapped down here, right? Because um, I always talk about the value and the value in your painting is the highest area of low and, um, and high, the darks and the lights in our painting. It's that greatest area of that dark and light in one area that tends to take over um, the painting and it, our eye gets totally drawn there all the time. So you can completely see that before my eye was really stuck down here and because there was no value that was similar to bring me up here, um, it, it just wouldn't allow it to happen, right? So now that I've seen that up here, because I just collaged this in with, with um, water, I can take it out and then I can decide if I want to change the color. And you know, I'm thinking that I need to do some black paint up there. And I can always change that too, right? But for now, let's put some, oh, it's already after, it's my time. Anyway, I'm going to end this for now. Thank you so much for watching. Um, and uh, I'm trying to stick to my schedule so that you guys can see that even in an hour, you can get lost in your creativity. But I am going to paint out some black up here because I feel that that's where my eye needs to go next. All right, thank you all for watching and uh, stay creative, keep going. And now that we're not live, maybe you can post those pictures um, into the comments so that we can all see what you're working on. Okay, bye.